Hiya pals, welcome back. Hey, you done? Happy New Year and all that. I'm wearing my, wait no, wait no, wait no. Vive lipstick today in the shade Alara, for those who care. Not sponsored, but I wish I was. The Deskford Carnix is a really cool Scottish instrument and today I'm going to tell you for why. This is also my first day of having my notes up on the screen in front of me rather than on a notebook down in front of me. So we'll see how that goes. Irony Scotland is a love of mine, but I'm always learning, all right? It's not my specific forte from uni or whatever. So bear with me, please. And if you have any questions or concerns or criticisms, if you have very specific Carnix knowledge, feel free to drop it in the comments below. And the bibliography will be in the description as well, as it always is, the bibliography and the further reading. I actually wrote a report on the desk for Carnix in uni, second year archaeology. And I read it back. Oh, and it was so cringe! So hopefully I can do some proper justice to it for you now. I got a B for it right enough. It wasn't that bad. Let's see if I've upped my skills any bit. Eh, let's have a go. <laughs> Pray tell, what is the Deskford Carnix, you may ask? I'm going to tell you right now. It's a Celtic war trumpet that was frequently used in battles against the Roman legions. That's, that goes for all Carnixes, by the way, not just the Deskford one. There was more than one Carnix in the world. And now when I say Celtic, that whole culture is a bit more complicated than it might at first seem. It's not one unified culture. It spans a lot further than you'd think. It's a topic for another time is what it is. I'm not going to get into the ins and outs of what is actually Celtic. But the desk for Carnix dates to AD 80 to 200, roughly. It's 1.66 metres tall, which makes it roughly 5 foot 5. Just a teeny, teeny, tiny bit shorter than me. It's absolutely massive or it would have been absolutely massive in its time. It's made from two metals as well, it's made from bronze and brass. However, brass is not native to Scotland, which means the brasses came from somewhere else. Now where did they get this brass? It was most likely Roman brass that they have recycled. Our ancestors were recycling, how great is that? Which is quite ironic to be honest because the carnix was used in wars against the Romans as a war trumpet, but it was partly made of Roman materials, so the Romans contributed to their opponents' war trumpets, which sounded a bit scary. That also helps to date the objects, because we know quite well the dates of when the Romans invaded Scotland, shall we say, when the Roman conquest happened. It's quite a securely dated time in Scottish history, and British history in general. But only the head survives, and it's shaped like a boar. The eyes have fell out, the ears have broken off, the tube of the horn, I guess you'd call it, has been broken off, but intentionally, um, and the the tongue is missing as well. There would have been a tongue inside its mouth. And it's one of the few artifacts that's actually had multiple reconstructions made of it, and I'll get into them a little bit later on as well. Presumably the tongue and the jaw were able to move, which would have some sort of effect on the sound that it made. Now, boars were really common when it came to Celtic art and Celtic culture and life, because obviously they were eaten. They played a big heart, a big heart? But they played a big part, obviously, in hunting and eating, dining, if you will. They also feature heavily in Celtic myth, for example, in the mythic Fenian cycle, uh, as strong supernatural creatures with magical abilities like to regenerate parts of their cells after they've been eaten. They're special creatures in the eyes of the Celts. And of course, the Fenian mythic cycle is more of a Irish thing, but like I said earlier, Celtic is not what it seems, okay, I'm not getting into it now because it is an entirely different kettle of fish that will send me on an absolute spiral. So it's, it's not as clear cut as you might think. Okay, moving on, thanks. And boars could also be read as symbols of royalty, bravery and uh, prowess in battle, as well as being a flippin' good meal. I'll give you a guess as to where the Deskford Carnix was found. In Deskford, obviously, which is in Banffshire. 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 It's in Scotland. And it was first found, according to the parish minister, in 1816 at the bottom of a peat bog. The area wasn't fully excavated until the 1990s by the National Museum of Scotland, which is actually where the desk for Carnix and one of its reconstructions sit today. And it looks as though the Carnix was actually sacrificed in a ritualistic manner. Alongside pottery, including Roman Samian wares, big chunks of meat and some fancy charm stones. So other than the Carnix, none of this stuff was actually seen as wealthy offerings. The museum actually suggests that they were more farmers offerings. Or more of the lower peasant classes. But obviously the Carnix is not a 
peasant offering <laughs> it's a massive beautiful cool thing which was actually dismantled prior to its deposition basically like killing and dismembering an animal and then chucking the bits into a pit sorry that was a bit sad wasn't it unbeknownst to some scottish soil is particularly acidic so it's quite hard to get things that have been preserved for so long depending on what material they're actually made from in peat bogs however you've got near perfect waterlogged conditions for preserving all manner of things right and it's thought that it was an iron age belief that such watery or wet places like bogs and rivers and the water just anywhere there's kind of watery bits they were seen as communication spots with the gods mortals would frequently take offerings to these places mortals Mortals would frequently take their offerings. <laughs> so they would commune with the gods at these watery spaces and leave their offerings there because they thought that was the place where the signal was strongest. Hence why so much stuff is found in peat bogs across Britain. For example, the Balachulish figure in the Lindel Man. Oh my god, who's talked about them before? And the Desford Carnix kind of represents the classic case of ritual deposition in archaeology, which basically means we don't really know why it was discarded in the way that it was. As a general rule in archaeology, if you don't understand the purpose of something that exists that you've found, if it's not obvious, or if you research and you just can't find a reason why this thing was made the way it was or left the way it was, just call it part of an unbeknownst to us ritual. Because bear in mind, a ritual doesn't need to be religious. People all the time in the modern day talk about, oh, this is my morning ritual. I get my, I get up at 5 a.m. <laughs> I get up at 6. I get up at 6, I stretch. I get a coffee. I focus. What do I do? I get up at 6. I get up at 6, I stretch. I make a coffee. I focus. So just because it's a ritual doesn't necessarily mean there's a religious side attached to it. But basically we have no clue. No matter what, if it is a proper sacrifice to the gods, something must have been going down at the time that required such an extravagant deposition. It, it could have been... A major threat from the Romans or it could have been chief of the tribe marrying off his daughter and wanting to wish well on the on the kids or whatever maybe it just broke and they didn't know how else to get rid of it or maybe someday it was raging and took a flaky and snapped it up and chucked it in a fit of rage we don't know the answers it's the beauty of archaeology I see that every video we don't know anyway I'm gonna take a sip of my hot chocolate here and then I'm gonna tell you all about the reconstructions and a bit about what it sounded like. Oh, that's good. Oh, that is good. Anyway, lucky for you, two reconstructions, I'm so sorry, two reconstructions have been made. One sits in the National Museum of Scotland beside the actual desk for Carnix head, which is the one I'll be showing you. And one belongs to a company called Carnix & Co, which is a company centered around musical archeology. span And I'll leave a link to that down below because it's actually a really interesting site if you want to check it out. So our reconstruction was made in 1992 by musicologist Dr. John Purser and metalsmith John Crete. They reconstructed it based off the Carnix remains that we physically have and examples of other carnices from around the world. There are a few other physical carnices that have been found or bits of them and there's a lot of imagery as well that they could use to base it off of. And apparently the full reconstruction took around 400 hours in modern, modern time. Can you imagine what that would have been like back in the Iron Age? Hellish. I believe they tried to replicate the original processes of what might have been done to create the carnix. I don't I'm not a metalsmith. I don't know how much handcrafting of things like that would have changed over time. I would assume not much. There's no heavy machinery involved, so I don't know. 400 hours. I'll leave another link in the description as well to uh, John Creed's video about his process of exactly how he made it. He takes you through step by step the whole making of the Carnix, which is actually really informative and really nice. And for those of you who are curious, if you have a look on Etsy, people still make and sell Carnices for sale if you have a spare couple hundred to couple thousand quid you too can own a carnage <laughs> God I turned into this thing and kettle there <laughs> Now Would you like to know what it sounded like? Before I show you this I must disclaim this might not be exactly what the Carnix sounded like in its time which could be down to the musician playing it is he playing it the way that Iron Age people would have played it? Is he holding it correctly? Was it actually reconstructed in a decent manner to match the real thing? Because looking at the real Carnix, 
We don't know what the inner makings of the tube were or how the mouth was really formed. There's a lot that's been reconstructed based on logic and mechanical skill. I'm saying that like it's... I'm talking about The Sims here. But there's a lot of different things that we should take into account about how this instrument is played. But based on what we know and how the reconstruction's been made, it could have sounded something like this. Wasn't that quite a haunting, harrowing sound, eh? So what can the Desper Carnix actually tell us about the use of carnices across Europe, across this Celtic landscape? The image of the Carnix clearly stuck with the Romans. Imagine you just came into the foreign land of Scotland and you're marching away from your wee marching camp and you hear that on the horizon and then you see all these maddos running towards you. How terrifying would that be when you're already in a country that you don't know cutting through a landscape that, in Roman mindset, was filled with barbarians. But like I mentioned earlier, there's a bunch of images across the continent of carnices, whether it's on coins, on vessels, uh, or in carvings, and like, there's loads of imagery, actually. There's even historical accounts of carnices being present when both Caesar and Claudius invaded Britain and during the attack on Delphi in 279 BC. There's even imagery examples from as far away as India. There's so few carnices that actually have survived till this time, but according to the imagery and according to history, they were from Britain to India. And they were absolutely terrifying. And you've actually probably seen a carnix. They're still used in modern cinema to be like a symbol of the Celts, as the Romans once used them as well. For example, in Gladiator. And also Brave. And although the Desper Carnix is very specific to Scotland, and I believe, I don't think there's another Carnix in Scotland, the Desper Carnix is not alone. There's another one called the Tintinac Carnix, eh, which is from France but it looks completely different and it's played in a completely different way. For starters, it has gigantic ears that are apparently, when it's played, they reverberate some of the sound. Um, and instead of being played completely vertically upright, like our carnix, it's played at like a slant, more like you would hold a trumpet out in front of you. And as I said earlier, there's very few images of the carnix actually being played, but one good example of carnix is being played comes from the Gundestrap cauldron. Have I said that correctly? Gunstrup. Gundestrup. It's spelt like this, cauldron, which shows a very, very clear image of musicians playing carnices completely upright. I'm assuming they were played that way. I mean, that's what the Desper Carnix reconstruction follows. But also, would they have done that just to preserve a bit of space on the cauldron? I don't know. I'm not an expert on this cauldron. The cauldron is not the main focal point of this video today, but it's something to take into account. But the Tintinac Carnix was found in a hoard with six other carnices and a bunch of other stuff as well. And it dates roughly to a time just after the Roman conquest of Gaul. Gaul, by the way, is roughly France. And if you take a full video on the Tintinac Carnix itself or the Gundestrup Cauldron, I'd be happy to do that. Just let me know. Of course, overlapping themes and such, but I'd be happy to supply if people would like. So despite not having many examples of carnices other than the Deskford one, the Tintinac one. I believe there's also one from Italy. They're quite widespread and much more commonplace than you'd think. Also let me know if you'd like a separate video all about Celtic and what counts as Celtic and what, you know, the whole Celtic culture thing and where it reaches to and whatnot because that is, that would take some time. <laughs> so there we have it. The Death for Carnix is very cool. Thank you very much. That's it. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you next week. I'm joking. Can you imagine hearing that thing over the misty mountains and coming through the glens? It'd be absolutely bloody terrifying, I tell you. It's called a war trumpet. There's loads of ancient texts which name it as a war trumpet. But was it though? I mean, it probably was used within battle settings, yes. But I'd assume it'd be more of an all-round instrument, like it was used in war but also it could be used at festivals, ceremonies, important gatherings and such. Kind of like the bagpipes, right? 
could be marching to war, you could be marching a bride down the aisle, or you could be standing on Princess Street playing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. That was another very Scottish specific example. Sorry, but you get the idea. The this for Carnac isn't the only one of its kind, but it's very specific to Scotland and I really like that. And it's absolutely incredible how much we can learn from the Death for Carnix and its reconstructions and how they play into the wider context across Europe and into the wider Celtic network, shall we say. Reaching from Scotland to France to Italy and all the way out to India, that's an incredible span. Obviously, the Death for Carnix itself maybe didn't do that entire travel. I mean, carnices as instruments in general. And that's only the examples that we are aware of as well. There could be far many more that are completely lost to us and lost to time or there could be more out there intact or otherwise or examples of them on coins and pots and whatever just we haven't found them yet thank you so much for watching i hope you learned something as i always say if you didn't watch it again and take notes this time how do you feel about the carnix i feel a sense of scottish pride when i think about the carnix it's been one of those artifacts that i latched onto especially like writing about it in second year um, and getting a good mark for it in second year, I was like, you, you are very special to me. Whoever owned the Carnix in life was shining upon me that day. But how do you feel about it? Please leave any questions, feelings, thoughts, whatever, in the description. In the description box? No. You're not allowed to type in there. You leave them in the comment section. I'll leave the bibliography and my further reading stuff in the description box. Thank you. Alongside my other social medias. And that'll be us for this week. Hope you have a lovely start to your January, folks. Tatty bye, troops. And I shall see you next Tuesday. Cheers. Mm -hmm.